To most of you, this is a creepy crawly, but I like to call animals like this incredible crawlies. Many people find it difficult to be friendly with worms, jellyfish or scorpions. That's because they are so different to us. We can relate to meerkats, apes, even goldfish. That's because they've got backbones like we have. But these are invertebrates. They've got no backbone and they are very strange. But I'm passionate about these and the reason is because of that strangeness. If I turn this light off now and illuminate these scorpions in ultraviolet, they glow in the dark. Nobody's quite sure why, but scorpions fluoresce in ultraviolet light. Look at these beauties. There are a thousand species, <laughs> a thousand species of scorpion. Only 30 of those are dangerous to us. But these would rather pinch me with those amazing pincers than use their stings. A sting from one of these wouldn't be much worse than a bee sting. They are extraordinary. Look at that. <laughs> these are emperor scorpions. They come from West Africa. They're one of the world's giant scorpions. And that's what I'm going to be doing, trying to find the biggest creepy crawlies in the world. Most creepy crawlies go unnoticed. But they make up over 95% of the animal kingdom. And they have an enormous impact on our lives. And creepy crawlies are our main competitors, taking a share from our foodstuffs and crops. These green fly are feasting on plant sap, but creepy crawlies can be beneficial too. Ladybirds protect our gardens from other creepy crawlies. About a third of our diet is a direct result of insect pollination. Without them, there'd be no oranges, cotton, potatoes or honey. But insects are just one group of invertebrates. There are many more and they're everywhere. A velvet swimming crab with bloodshot eyes. This isn't a flower, it's a snake locks an enemy. A creepy crawly that doesn't creep or crawl. It sits still and stuns small passers-by with its stinging tentacles. Amazing as these creatures are, it's not often that people celebrate them. It's the village of Nantwich's annual worm charming contest. Each team is given a small plot and half an hour to collect as many earthworms as possible. But they're not allowed to dig. The worms have to be shaken to the surface, literally vibrated up. Any acre of ordinary ground like this can have up to 50 million earthworms. What's this technique? This is twanging. Twanging? Twanging, yeah. Some worms like it with the right hand and some worms like it with the left. But Williston like it with both hands. <laughs> like can I help? Yeah. Don't go too quickly because you get premature worm grasping. <laughs> premature worm grasping. You can hold it hard you not care. This makes me feel proud to be British. Absolutely. Where else in the world could this happen? Nowhere. Do you feel eccentric? Wonderful. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Good twanging. Thank you. Do you like touching them? No, not really. Why not? Slightly? Yeah, we do. One minute! He's not out! Now he's out! And he's out! Oh, we've got 
Wait a minute, we've got the... One year, the winner caught 511 worms during the 30 minutes of the tournament. There are prizes for the most worms and the biggest worm. These are about as big as they get in Europe and North America. But the worms I'm looking for aren't just big, they're giants. And they live on the other side of the world. I'm going to South Gippsland, near Melbourne, Australia. There's only a small area where the monster worms are found, and Bill Green is proud that his dairy farm is in the middle of it. One of the few people in the world with a PhD in earthworms does her research here. She's scientist Beverly Van Prague. Hi, Bev. You've done most of the work here. We have. We've dug a great big trench. And is it looking good for worms? It's Any looking, evidence? It's looking great because we just found this egg capsule, egg cocoon. That is remarkable. What's, what's in there? There's one growing embryo there or one growing young worm. So one worm will hatch out of that huge yeah. egg? That's bizarre. It's just like an aubergine. How long do they take to hatch, Beverly? They take about 12 months. Though we're not really sure, but at least 12 months. I can't wait to see the adults. We have to be careful. This is like doing some delicate surgery. The worms are very <laughs> rare and are easily injured. Okay. And that's a myth about earthworms regenerating. It is, yeah. Some bit. earthworms can, but this earthworm certainly can't. Yeah. And most earthworms, you don't get two earthworms when you chop them in half. That is a bit of a myth. Oh, look, Nigel. There's is the that, end of one. There's the, yeah. the tail there. Yeah. That, look at the size of that. That's going to be a big worm. Colour, there we go. That would, look, 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 look at that. <gasps> that would frighten our blackbirds, yeah. I'll tell you, back in they England. They wouldn't know what's wrong. <laughs> Gently it, pull him out. It's so yeah. busting, let me. If you feel any stress or resistance, just stop. Look um, at that. The Gippsland giant earthworm. That is incredible. It's over a metre, over three feet long. They go to twice this size. You can see the mouth coming out there. That's what they used to swallow dirt. It's not much of a life being an earthworm, burrowing through the soil and swallowing mud. And then they take out bits of leaf and root and that's what they feed on. You can see the segment that's on the body there. You can feel a roughness. There are four pairs of hairs on each of the segments and they use those to anchor themselves when they're burrowing through the soil. This is one of the biggest earthworms in the world. Look at that, what a magnificent specimen it is. If you put it back in the tunnel now, and it'd be okay if we... Yep, if we gently put it back and cover it with soil, it should survive okay. Yep. Australia is a land of giant creepy crawlies. Queensland in the north is home to some of the world's biggest insects. Now I'm looking for a kind of creepy crawly most people would never want to see. I'm on the edge of the rainforest in some eucalyptus woodland. There's a few people that have a phobia about moths, but the giant insects I'm looking for now, they make most people skin crawl. But it's only because a few of them have followed us into our houses and hotels, and when you switch on the light, they scurry across the floor or go like lightning up the wall. But cockroaches can be cute. The rhinoceros cockroach, the most massive in the world. <laughs> Look at that. That must have been the inspiration for Darth Vader. <laughs> oh, they've got really sharp claws that they use for burrowing. Most insects are short-lived, but these can live for a decade or more. They can weigh 35 grams. That's as much as two sparrows. This is a female. She's got a flat shield on the front of her body. The males have got a concave one. Totally clean. They just feed on leaves on the forest floor. Look at that. <laughs> so I'll let it go now. Most of the 4,000 odd species of cockroach are harmless forest dwellers. The rhinoceros cockroach is one of the largest, but believe it or not, there are even bigger insects. To see them, I need to go to remote islands off New Zealand.
These are the Poor Knights Islands, just off New Zealand. They've hardly changed since dinosaurs roamed here over 200 million years ago. How many poor knights are there? Two, there's a group of three. These are the main islands here. They've got a little island just back up there. The insect we're searching for is a relic from that age. Right, Nigel. It's hunted by an ancient reptile that's just as old. I'm excited about seeing both of them. I'm here with Richard Parrish, an insect expert from the Department of Conservation, and Robert Patera, a Maori. For his people, this is a sacred site. The helicopter will return in four days. The rest of today is for setting up camp. It's a beautiful spot that few people ever get to see or hear. Seeing one of these has been one of my life's ambitions. Look at that. Looks like a lizard, but it's not. It's an ancient order of reptiles, unchanged for 60 million years. Their ancestors were around for 225 million years. It's a survivor from the age of the dinosaurs. So this really is a living fossil. Tuatara, it's a Maori name, and it means line of spears. This is a big male, and you can see this line of soft white spines on its back of its neck and down its back. <laughs> Beautiful eyes, it just blinked at me. They've got vertical pupils, they're always nocturnal and they move around at much cooler temperatures than most other reptiles. This fellow could be a hundred years old, they really live for a long time. This is the predator of the giant insect that we're looking for. So we've seen the predator, now we need to find the prey. The Tuatara are so still because the night's so cold. But the giant grasshopper we're after moves like lightning. Yeah, there's one. Can you keep the torch on it? What a spectacular. There are, Richard. That's great, Nigel. Well yeah, done. She's That's... so docile. Didn't even try to bite. That's a lovely female. Look at that. She's a beauty. You gonna weigh her now? Yep, I'll get it. Thanks, Rob. Can't Thanks, wait to Robert. see how much she weighs. She'll be a beauty. Well, the biggest one I've ever had is 42 grams for a female. That's... So 42 grams, that's twice the weight of a mouse? Yes, yeah, they're, they're real heavy. Ah. That's 47 grams and the bag's seven grams, so that one's 40 grams, so. That's a good sized female, that one. Nearly as big as they're getting the... Yep. I'll let it go. These are, these are very rare indeed, aren't they? They are, yes. They're only found on these two islands. Come on, um, girl. If we ever get rats on these islands accidentally, then uh, that'll be the end of them, unfortunately. A giant wetter. Look at that. Surely one of the most spectacular and unusual insects on the earth. She looks really fearsome. It's got a frightening array of spiny legs. This great long thing like a sting at the end of their tail, that's actually the ovipositor. She uses that for egg laying. What a beautiful creature she is. Like with the caterpillar, she's got a line of spiracles along her body. Those are the openings to the breathing tubes. They go inside the body and take oxygen directly to the tissues. This method of breathing is why insects can't get much larger than this. She's a really <laughs> peaceful vegetarian. Off you go, girl. Brilliant. My first giant wetter. <laughs> she seems to wave goodbye. 
I found an insect that's just about as big as insects get, but other invertebrates can get much bigger. They live on Christmas Island. I'm in a spectacular part of Christmas Island called the Blowholes. This is part of an ancient coral reef that was formed millions of years ago. It's been eroded by wave action, the wind, and now there's holes in it, and the surge of the sea pushes water up like a series of geysers. Christmas Island is the peak of an ancient volcano that rises three miles from the floor of the Indian Ocean. The island was named on Christmas Day in 1643 by Captain William Miners. The giants I'm looking for are in the rainforest down there. The invertebrates this island is famous for are its red crabs. There are over 10 million of them. They eat fallen leaves, but the giant crab I'm after has giant food. Fresh coconut for robber crabs, this is a delicacy. They can only break into a coconut if it's already slightly cracked. So they have to wait for the nuts to fall off the trees and hit something hard. Then they pry them open and delicately pick out the flesh. That prying open, though, takes real power. These are the crabs I want to see. And for any naturalist, the meeting with these robber crabs really isn't a disappointment. They're the undisputed giants of the invertebrates on the land. These claws are really formidable. Got great power in them. <laughs> it's coming straight even me. Hello. When I frighten it, it does this. <laughs> Lifting its leg up to frighten attackers. Crabs are creepy crawlies with two pairs of antennae. The lower ones are for smelling, in this case coconut milk, while the larger upper pair are touchy-feely, so one crab can detect when another gets too close. This is the big one. This is it. This is the big robber crab I've been waiting for. Look at that. Those amazing pincers. These textures underneath the body are absolutely amazing. It's so heavy, they grow to be about the size of a medium-sized dog. And this creature is superbly adapted for life on the land, so much so, if you put these in the sea, they drown within minutes. But no invertebrates on the land can get bigger than this creature. The reason being, this hard exoskeleton. To grow, they need to molt. If they get really huge, by the time the exoskeleton's hardened, it's sort of collapsed with gravity. The other thing is, it's like having a suit of armour on. If the body got any bigger, these legs wouldn't be able to support the weight of it. And that's why this is the biggest invertebrate you get on the land. Invertebrates can't get bigger than these. Fantastic robber crabs. <laughs> There's another one feasting on the coconut there. Off you go. This is the biggest land creepy crawly. The sea, though, is where the real monsters are. I'm still around Australia on a Tasmanian fishing boat, hauling in catches from waters that are three miles deep. The nets go as deep as two miles, and they've hauled in some real sea monsters. I'm hoping that they'll catch one on this trip. A miniature squid. It's not the giant we're looking for, but it shows you all the features. Believe it or not, cephalopods, head-footed, you can see why they're called head-footed. They're actually mollusks, where the shell is inside the body. Cuttlefish have a big shell inside their body, which budgerigars chew on. But squid and octopus have a tiny shell, which helps them swim their streamliners. They're as far from a snail or shellfish as you can imagine. This is about 
two feet 60 centimetres long, the giant squid is 60 feet long. That's about three quarters the length of this whole boat. <laughs> Sometimes these are found entangled in the outside of the nest. They're the feeding tentacles torn off a giant squid. Look at that, this is just the tip. They can go to 12 metres long. There's muscles all down these. They squeeze the muscles, it's just like a tube of toothpaste. And these tentacles shoot out and grab the prey. And then these great tentacular clubs go into the fish, these horny rims embed, and the squid then takes the food back to its mouth. They've got two of these great long feeding tentacles. When they actually attack their prey, they actually adhere them together by this press studge arrangement here, just like on a jacket. Five days of seasickness and no sea monster to show for it. The only thing now is for me to become a beachcomber. Here in Tasmania, giant squid can be washed up on the shore. What a stupendous animal. And these tentacles, look at this, it's like an alien flower. And if you're thinking this would be superb, cutting rings like calamari, you'd be wrong. Oh, tastes absolutely awful, taste of ammonia. This is what squid use as a buoyancy mechanism, giant squid, to keep them buoyant in the depths. They've got pockets of ammonia, that's much lighter than water, and that's what keeps them buoyant and up there in the sea. But what a tremendous, and this beak, I wouldn't be doing this to a living giant squid. That is so powerful, look at that. It's like a parrot's beak, but it's so powerful it can crush bone. This is an especially good specimen, and it's headed for the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, which has sent out a team to take it there. I couldn't carry it on my own. How much do you think this one weighs? A couple of hundred. Oh, have to be. And what's the heaviest ever? Nearly a ton? Uh, half. Half a ton. No one has ever seen a giant squid alive, but there's another kind of giant cephalopod whose home isn't as dark, deep, and so inaccessible. I'm going to Canada to visit it, to Victoria Island, British Columbia. Of all of the world's oceans, this corner of the Northeast Pacific is the richest in nutrients. As a result, food is plentiful and animals can become huge. We're here because beneath the surface there's a land of giants. This is the home of the giant octopus. The biggest one ever caught weighed 600 pounds. That's three times my weight. And that creature had an arm span of 9.6 meters. That's over 30 feet. Also down there, there is an outstanding supporting cast of other marine creepy crawlies. There's sponges that can grow so huge, they're the size of a bus. There's giant sea cucumbers, there's big starfish, and there's the biggest nudibranch in the world. Most of those are easy to see, because they don't move very much, but the giant octopus, that is a very mobile predator. And I've got to keep my fingers crossed that we can find a big one of those. Creepy crawlies can be bigger in the sea because the water supports their weight. A lion's mane jellyfish with tentacles a hundred feet long and a bell that's wider than a dustbin lid. I'm 110 feet down, the deepest I've ever been. I'm here to see an exquisite creature. It's not this copper rockfish, it's the giant cloud sponge it lives in. These magnificent cloud sponges are animals. They survive by filtering particles of food from the water. They can grow to be as big as a bus and live for three or four thousand years. Here's a pile of crab shells, the midden of a giant octopus, the place where it puts the leftovers from its meals. The midden is usually just outside its lair.
It looks huge. There's its siphon. It uses that for breathing and jetting through the water. There's an eye. Octopus have eyes just like a human's. It can see me pretty well. It uses those suckered arms to catch food, killing its prey with a sharp, horny beak. I found my giant octopus, but I'm out of air. Tonight, I'll be back for a cuddle. That was an astounding dive. For anyone who loves invertebrates, nearly every group was represented there. I'll never forget those cloud sponges. And we found the midden and lair of a giant octopus. They sometimes move homes. So we're going to come back tonight and see if the octopus is out and about. It's cold in there though, and I think I've deserved a veggie burger and some onion rings. I wouldn't dive at night for the first time on my own with a giant octopus. I've got some expert help. Dave, you've dived with them lots of times. Many times. What have I got to watch out for? Mainly, they sometimes get a little curious. They might stick an arm up over your mask, your regulator. They don't attack divers, though, do they? No, Never. No, they're just curious. They want to see what you are. And uh, if they, if you try to push them away, all you're going to do is pop out your regulator or your mask because they're still holding. So up. the suckers are really powerful. Very powerful. If anybody from the 19th century could see me doing this, they'd think I was committing suicide. There were plenty of stories about the giant octopus then. It was called the devilfish and was meant to have leathery arms studded with sharp pointed suckers that could tear human flesh. Just diving at night is eerie enough in itself. And it's really eerie when we finally see a shape. It's scooting along the bottom, taking water into its bag-like body then shooting it out of its siphon to jet propel it. It's hard to believe that something this quick is a relative of snails and clams, a mollusk. I need to overtake it and then intercept. This is a big one, about 15 feet long, with an arm span of nearly 20 feet. There's a big brain in there too. Octopus are reckoned to have the biggest brains of any invertebrate. Creature caresses me gently. There's nothing hostile in this embrace. That big brain gives it the intelligence of a domestic cat, and this is cat like curiosity. I feel so privileged to have been in the arms of a giant octopus. But there are monster creepy crawlies that are a lot less friendly than that. To find them, I'm going to Ecuador. To the Amazon rainforest. 
Down among these trees, there's a predator that terrifies everyone and everything that lives here. When the forest animals sense it's on the hunt, they clear out of its way, if they can, but a lot of them can't. It could be anywhere around here. Here's my monster. Some scientists say that you shouldn't think of ants as individual insects so much as part of a colony. And it's the colony that's the real animal. And it's as fierce as any predator ever gets. I'm standing right in the middle of a raiding party of army ants. They are swarming around me. I've got my trousers tucked in my socks. As long as I'm still, I should be okay. They follow a chemical trail laid down by the ant leaders. That trail of pheromones, if you disrupt it by moving around, they swirl around, they could rush right up me. And they are sweeping through the forest all around me. The leaf litter is almost boiling with insects and small creatures that are jumping out of their path. They are extraordinary hunters. They sweep under logs, under leaves, any creatures hiding there, even nocturnal ones like crickets or um, scorpions, they force them out, kill them, cut them up, and then take them back to the colony. I'm at the swarm front. Anything that can run, jump, scurry, anything, they get out of the way of these ants. This is a beautiful little poison arrow frog. They've got a very toxic skin, but even that may not protect them from these ants. So I'm gonna take it well away from the swarm front and out of harm's way. This is a beauty. Scientists call the colony a super organism. It has sinuous arms and a huge long body, and there's perfect cooperation among its moving parts. The society works together. Each of the workers has different roles. There's workers that go out and catch the prey. There's workers that go out and bring the prey back. And there's these big soldier ants. Their job is to defend any other members of the colony that need defending. There we are. Look at that. Oh, that's the biggest cast in the colony. This is a soldier ant. They have got incredible mandibles. South American army ants can sting and bite, particularly the soldiers. And the natives here, they use those jaws to seal up cuts. They actually put the ants on their flesh, the jaws close, and then they pull the ants body away and the cut is closed. You see, it's really sticking those sickle shaped mandibles into my flesh and trying to sting at the same time. And that, that is, hurts a bit, but not too much. To see army ants in action is truly awe-inspiring. The colony is made up of hundreds and thousands of individuals but it depends on them all working together. They've all got different jobs to do. Here's the soldiers here, guarding the workers as they return. Some of them have got food and they're going back to feed the grubs and the queen. This is a blind army though. They can hardly see anything. They can only see moving shapes. They do everything by chemicals. There's a chemical trail here, a chemical trail of pheromones. And there's more coming here. They've obviously raided a termite's nest. This, oh, look at that. They're carrying termite grubs in their jaws. They sort of straddle the termite grub and just carry it, put their legs on either side and run, just streaming back. If I can track them back far enough, I could find their bivouac their mobile base camp. I followed the ant processions through the rainforest and they've led me to this one tree and to this. It's an army ant bivouac. It's made entirely of the bodies of the ants themselves. The workers gather together, they've got hooks on the end of their legs and they all join up. This is a lattice work of ants. Every day, ants will spill out from that 
on a raid, they'll scour the forest floor and bring back food to the queen and the grubs that are hidden deep inside that bivouac. When this bivouac sweeps out over the forest floor, the forest floor goes black. They're acting as one huge superorganism. Surely this is the biggest creepy crawly of them all.